Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent, your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I got a very special guest who has operations out in Japan, but unfortunately isn't there right now, but still is super awesome because their company's been around for a while and is international and, again, has a ton of emphasis on making sure that we continue to broaden the crypto and blockchain space uh, across all continents. Uh, we have Joel with Bitflyer. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Well, you know, before we dive in too deep, how about you let us know a little bit, a bit about yourself and give us some background? Sure. Yeah, I started in uh, tech. I worked for IBM for a while. Um, kind of got a little bit bored with that. Went into finance with a master's degree. Was on the dark side of finance and traditional finance. So I worked in Tokyo, London, uh, Citigroup, State Street, uh, Leg Mason, BNP Paribas, a lot of different places. Uh, a lot of different things. Um, so yeah, the IT and, and finance is kind of the background I've got. Amazing. So I mean, with, with being in finance, I mean, it sounds like a great transition over into the, the crypto blockchain space. Well, but what was the first time that you learned about cryptocurrency? Like what year was it and how did it even get onto your radar? Sure. Yeah, actually, um, it was around 2015 or so uh, when I was working in... Um, London. There was a friend of mine that, that sat next to me and he and I were, you know, reading the news about, you know, Bitcoin and things are going crazy and crypto is all cool and everything like that. And, you know, he was British, I was American. So naturally we were arguing about things all the time. Um, but yeah, he and I just started talking about it and like almost every day we were talking about, you know, crypto and, and w what it means and what blockchain means. Um, and, you know, BNP Paribas is a very traditional, you know, French bank, but they were very early getting into blockchain. They have their own division of blockchain. They've actually implemented it um, inside the, the traditional banking world. So, yeah, I was exposed to it quite early uh, there. Um, so, yeah, it was quite good. Um, I even tried to get into, you know, investing, but, you know, my wife kind of stopped me on that one. But uh, <laughs> gotcha. yeah, no, it was all good from the early days around 2015 or so. That's amazing. And so, of course, as you kind of transition out of the you know, traditional finance world into you know, creating what is now BitFlyer, you know, give us that kind of transition into what made you want to get out of traditional finance and go just head first into cryptocurrency. Yeah. So I've done many things in, in traditional finance. I, I've worked in capital markets. I worked in asset management, trust, custody businesses, I even did insurance, which is really boring. Um, but, you know, once you get into, uh, you know, you see the promise of crypto, there's so many problems within finance that are still left to be solved. I mean, it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, but there's still tons of problems, uh, lots of inefficiencies, and blockchain technology is a way to solve a lot of that. So when you're in that space, it, it's more obvious to be able to see what those problems uh, the potential is for the change that you can make. So it's quite exciting to get into it. It's still very early days, a lot of easy things that need to be solved, some longer term things that need to be solved. So it's just exciting. And that's why I wanted to get into it. Awesome. And so, you know, tell us the transition into, you know, Bitflyer, you know, when did you create this company? And, and what was the purpose of you starting this up? Yeah, so the company was originally created by uh, two Japanese guys, one named Yuzo Kano and the other is Komiyama-san. And, you know, they didn't start it in a garage. They actually started in a bakery, uh, <laughs> which is interesting. So I guess if you yeah. want to start a bakery, it's a great place to do it. Um, so they, they started out kind of around 2014 with the idea uh, of creating a way for people to get into crypto, particularly Bitcoin, uh, in a safe way. So this is around the time of the Mount Gox scandal and everything like that. Right. Um, so they came from Goldman Sachs. They brought that traditional uh, view into um, their new company that they set up to make it safe for the individual investor. And it really took off in Japan. They're now the largest uh, crypto company in Japan. Um, they're usually within the top five or so in the world because Japan's a huge market for crypto. Right. They've actually integrated it into, you know, just normal buying. So you can actually take, you know, your BitFlyer account and go into an electronic store and buy electronics with Bitcoin. Uh, you can do that today in Japan. Um, they have a lot of different services that are kind of make it really available that um, you don't see yet in, in other countries, but in Japan is quite advanced. Um, so they built this structure out um, to just bring it to everyday people and, and the promise of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So I was there in Japan. I met with them 
thought it was really exciting. They had a, a huge opportunity in the U.S. They really wanted to grow and get into the U.S. They wanted to make sure it was a truly international company, a global company. We've got offices in the EU as well, so they asked me to come over uh, and kind of help them uh, accelerate the growth in the U.S. That's amazing. There's a couple of things I kind of want to go back to that I, I would like you to expand on. So, for example, you said that they... Uh, people in Japan right now can use their accounts to go and, and buy things with, with Bitcoin. Can you kind of walk us through like, what is that use case? Like, how are they actually doing that? Yeah. So there's kind of two major ones that they're linked into. So there's a, a company called a uh, big camera, which is kind of the best buy of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go in and, and they have a counter and they have a, like these big signs that say Bitcoin and you can just go in and, and purchase things using Bitcoin uh, wallet. So they've actually built that payments infrastructure into um, their point of sale systems. Um, it's still uh, not the fastest thing in the world because they have to wait for the, the, the confirmation of it, but it, it's, right. it's there today where you can just purchase. You don't need to pull money out of your wallet. You can just go ahead and buy with Bitcoin. The other one is they're linked with um, one of the largest um, booksellers in Japan, kind of the Barnes and Noble of Japan and okay. their loyalty program. So you can actually, you know, get the loyalty points at this bookstore and then turn it into Bitcoin wow. um, on your account. So it's really cool. So it's really not just a, a company that's, you know, totally dependent on trading and, and what's the price of Bitcoin, but how does it make your life easier and simpler and how can you use Bitcoin and crypto in your everyday life? No doubt. And I mean, that brings up a really good point that I, I've, mentioned multiple times in the past of like, how do we get to mass adoption? And mass adoption is doing things just like you just said that Bitfire is doing right now in mm -hmm. Japan with having everyday use cases of, hey, I want to go buy this thing. I have Bitcoin. I should be able to pay for this in Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. this is that, that way to get that done. Um, mm -hmm. As I, you know, in the beginning of this segment, we talked about how you are expanding or Bitfire is expanding into multiple countries. Mm -hmm. Are they beginning to create these types of functionalities in, in other countries like the United States as well? Or, or you know, what does that game plan kind of look like? Well, absolutely, we want to do it. Um, every single country is a little bit different. The laws are different. The culture is different. The, the speed of adoption is going to be different. And, right. and you know, this is not going to be something that's very simple and easy. I mean, the, the e-commerce world has taken decades to get to where it is today. Um, and, and cryptocurrency is still in the early stages. So um, the quick answer is yes, absolutely. We want to make it like that. So it's uh, in there to help you on your day-to-day -day stuff, help you save money, help you save time. Absolutely want to go there. Uh, we need to build out the infrastructure, to build out the ecosystem to make that happen. But it's absolutely where we want to go. Right. Now, that's amazing. So, you know, tell us like, I know that you say you're in a couple of different countries right now, but like, give me all of the, the ways that people can come and use Bitflyer right now. So like, if I am a listener right now, like what are the ways that, uh, in, depending on what country I'm in, like how can I come in and use Bitflyer? So obviously in Japan, um, you have the, the biggest infrastructure in place, so you can use it in multiple ways there. In the U.S., we're still building it out. So in the U.S., we have you know your traditional crypto exchange where you can buy uh, sell on the exchange. We also have uh, an easy, simple buy sell program. And that's about as far as we've gotten at this point. Um, and Europe is the same. So we've got licenses in the US in about 47 states, 48 states. Um, we're even that's in good. Hawaii now, which is kind of new. Yeah. Um, so that's good. So we're about all over the place. So we just need to build it out. And then we also are licensed in Europe. So the entire European Union we cover um, with those same type of products. Uh, and then the next stage is to um, build out the infrastructure that we've built in Japan and now carry it over to uh, the US and EU. It's amazing. So, I mean, y'all are expanding. You told me, uh, you know, before we came on the show, like how y'all been around for a while and it's, it's really cool to be able to, to see that growth. Um, and, and with this, I know that you've seen a lot change kind of uh, in the market over the, over the last several years, but especially in 2020 with COVID and everything else going on. But what are some things uh, in the space, in the, in the crypto blockchain space that you think people should be aware of that you think could happen uh, in the relative short future? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of experimentation and innovation going on. Uh, you, you, if you're in the crypto space, you hear DeFi all the time. Um, and, and it's a very exciting space. It, it's not... The, the safest place to be, but it's very exciting, the innovation that's going on. Um, so being able to take things like borrowing and lending and, and getting interest returns on, on your assets 
uh, are very, very uh, basic in traditional finance, but it's new in, in the crypto world. So they're trying to figure out how do they make that work in a blockchain? How do they make that work so it's safe and people are not going to get scammed and it's easy to do and everything like that. So the basic infrastructure is kind of being experimented with, but that customer experience is not there. That safety is not there. Um, but I think that's a very exciting area that we need to get into and we need to mature and, and build it out. Um, there's a lot of experiments as far as, you know, how you do liquidity, which is more for the institutional side, because now we see a lot of institutional business coming into the crypto world, bringing billions and billions of dollars into it. Right. Um, and, and how do you, how do you scale up to something like that? I mean, these are guys that, you know, you know, trillions of dollars go through their financial systems, uh, every single year. So, you know, a billion dollars doesn't really mean that much to them. Um, but it means a lot within the crypto world. So we have right. to be able to scale and, and be able to provide, you know, the services that they expect. Um, and then on the, the individual customer side, you know, we need to do a better job of making things simple and easy for people. If we have to explain it, then it's too difficult, right? Yeah. It, it needs to be simple enough to just, you know, people get it and they can use it. Um, and, and we need to do a better job of that. So there's a lot of work, I think, being done on the design side. Uh, to make things simpler, that um, is pretty exciting, for sure. And and I'm I'm gonna kind of backtrack to uh, you're in a un unique spot in that you've been in the traditional finance field, and um, I also come from that as well. And so I kind of have more of a tailored question for you on the sense of you know, especially being the U.S. Uh, United States, we have elections coming up, we have everything that's going on with uh, our dollar kind of doing whatever it's doing right now and equities, I think potentially are over leveraged and there's a lot that are just this giant snowball that is being formed right now. You know, yeah. what do you think or how do you think uh, cryptocurrency is positioned to handle what is coming within the U S equities market? Oh, wow. That's a very leading question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're right. There, there is a huge disconnect between what's happening in the financial world and what's happening in the real world. When you have millions of people unemployed on one side, but then you have record stock uh, prices on the other, it, it doesn't make sense because the stock price is supposed to reflect the reality of the economy and, and send you proper price signals. Right. Um, it doesn't do that anymore because the Fed uh, and the federal governments have intervened so much in there that the price signal is lost, right? So right. it's essentially manipulated. Um, and, and that's actually one of the reasons why crypto and blockchain in particular, Bitcoin were created at the end of 2008 with the last financial uh, crisis. Right. Um, there was so much intervention that people were started to lose trust in the financial uh, markets and, and the government's capability to, to manage it. So the idea was, okay, we, we will create something that doesn't need that trust where the trust is built in and you just trust the code and separate the power of money from government. So they can't inflate away your savings and wipe out your savings. And you see this happening, you know, in Venezuela today. Right. So I think it's very important that, you know, that there is this alternative path where you can, you know, protect your savings, you can protect your wealth that you've worked hard to build. Um, and you're not dependent on, you know, decisions that are being made that you don't really have a say in. Um, so I think that's very important. But it's still very, very early days. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make it happen. But I think it's very promising. And then when you see what's happening in the stock market, to kind of loop back to that conversation, um, you know, it can't constantly inflate like that. Uh, right. There has to be a time where, where, you know, it comes back down to reality and it, it links back into reality. Um, and when that happens, you know, people are going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, so with all things, you know, you have to make sure that you protect yourself, you know, what's happening uh, in the markets um, and you have a proper balanced portfolio that to, to kind of balance those things out. Um, if the government starts doing what they did after World War II and just inflate away the debt, um, then all the senior citizens today that are on fixed income are going to be really hurting because the buying power of their money is just really going to de uh, decrease. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a delicate situation. I think people need to be aware of that um, and they need to protect themselves.
I agree. Um, I was speaking with a previous speaker and one of the things that they brought up, um, which is interesting because, uh, you know, with your company being based in Japan, so Japan's when, when the market went as high as it ever did, it went down and it's never recovered and gotten back to that point. And the United States market looks very similar to when that happened. Right. And I really think that when you look at once this snowball finally just takes speed and does what it's going to do, that crypto could be positioned to be this absolute amazing place where you start to try to diversify your, your portfolio and crypto looks very appetizing. So I think right now could be a really awesome time to be exploring this space. Yeah, no, it's a really cool time. Totally agree. For sure. And, and, and with that said, you know, outside of all of that that's going on, you know, with BitFlyer and everything that y'all are building on, you know, what do you think uh, is something that our listeners should be looking out for? Let's call it the next, you know, five to 10 years in this next decade. So as you said, it's very early. Crypto is very early in where we presently are, but like for where we're headed and, and what's to come, you know, what are some things that you think people should be looking out for? I think is one thing is to not get caught up in all the hype, um, to look for the real underlying value. You know, how is it going to save you time? Active assets. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up with that the prices are increasing or whatever. Um, but these projects in, in crypto are, are actually trying to solve problems, right? Just like a company is there delivering a product and a service, these projects in crypto are also delivering value. And that's where we need to be focusing. What's the fundamental value that they're creating? And then that should reflect into the value of the coin that's associated with it. So understand the projects, just like you would understand a company that you're investing in on the stock market. Find the ones that are solving the problems that you think should be solved. And those are the ones that you want to watch and to go after. Um, there's going to be lots of things coming in. You can't keep track of all of them. So, you know, Focus on the things that you can really get into and be interested in um, and don't get caught up in the hype. Absolutely. I think it's always really great advice. Do your own research, DYR, do your own research um, and, and don't just blindly go into something. Um, so again, really appreciate your time today, Joel. Um, but before you go, you know, what is a final thought that you want to leave with all of our listeners here today? Good question. Um, I think one of the things that is important to me is to always be curious, right? To always be curious, always be asking what's behind it. Um, there are a lot of fascinating things happening in the crypto space, whether you're interested in finance or even just in the technology and the blockchain side. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff, even new business models that are being created. Um, so just be curious, you know, start simple, um, go with an established firm, you know, like Bitflyer, I'll put my plug in, yes. but, you know, start simple with, uh, somebody that you can trust and, and be curious and, and try to understand what's happening in this space and do your own research. It's very early days. So there's all kinds of fun and exciting stuff to get into. There's still plenty of opportunity for people. Uh, it's still very much a growing market. Um, it's like being in internet and e-commerce in the 1980s. So it's a yeah. long way to go. Absolutely. Uh, I would 100% echo that. Um, we're, we're, there's just so much green space, so much green room for us and anyone to be able to get into this space, make your mark and, and just keep learning, educating yourself and following your curiosity. So again, Joel, really appreciate that final thought. What are some ways that people can connect with you and learn more about BitFlyer? So I, I'm on uh, Twitter, so uh, BitFlyer underscore Joel. Um, I also am on LinkedIn, so Joel Edgerton at uh, BitFlyer. So you can find me there. Um, and then obviously you can contact me through BitFlyer itself. Awesome. Well, again, really appreciate your time today. And for everyone listening, stay CryptoCurrent. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of CryptoCurrent. For more information on this episode and all of our episodes, please visit us at www.crypto-current.co. Stay up to date with the latest news in cryptocurrency. You'll receive daily emails Monday through Friday that are personalized and curated content specific to you and your interest, powered by artificial intelligence. Are you an accredited investor looking to invest in cryptocurrency? Crescent City Capital can help. Go to crescentcitycapital.com for more information. If you're finding value in our content, please take five minutes to leave a five-star review and a great comment. Also, please make sure to share this podcast with others. Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the quality of this podcast. I can only thank my 
amazing producer, Andrew DeRitter, with DeRitter Productions, who has put this together. If you have any podcast, visual, or video needs, please go to DeRitterProductions.com. That's D-E-R-I-T-T-E-R Productions.com. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Cryptocurrent with Richard Carthon. We'll be back with more exciting developments from the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency next week. But until then, stay Cryptocurrent. Please use available exits now.